Hello, in this lesson I will discuss about management of type 1 DM and the DK. To start with QEs, a 28 kg school age children taking certain international unit total daily insulin for the past 6 months with fair glycemic control has a flu since 3 days back and his random blood sugar is 400 now with negative ketone. You want to decrease his random blood sugar to a target of 160 mg per day. How much regular insulin do you need to give just as a correction dose? I will answer this question in the middle of the discussion. Now let us go to the discussion. To start from introduction, diagnosis of type 1 DM or DM is made by one of the following three criteria. The first is after 8 hours of fasting, plasma glucose greater than or equal to 126 mg per day on two occasions, or symptoms of hyperglycemia and random blood sugar more than or equal to 200 mg per day, and hemoglobin A1c more than 6.5% is a diagnostic criteria to diagnose DM. The goals of management of DM in children include maintaining normal growth, development, and emotional maturation, increasing self-independent management as a child grows is an ongoing goal, and training the patient and the family to provide appropriate daily diabetes care in order to attain glucose control within the range of predetermined goals and to recognize and treat hypoglycemia. Balancing strict glycemic control, which reduces the risk of long-term sequel and avoidance of severe hypoglycemia, which is more likely with stricter control should be strictly told to the family. To start from DK management, DK should be given important concern because 10 to 40 percent of newly diagnosed DM in children is associated with DK in developed world and around 80 percent of newly diagnosed diabetes patients in our setup. 83 percent of diabetes related days in children are caused by DK, which is thought to be preventable. And children days and five years of age are twice as likely to present in DK and overall unconscious children are 12 times more likely to die. So DK should be given important concern. When we see the mechanism by which blood glucose decreases when treating ketoacidosis, the first and the top mechanism is by decreased hepatic glucose production, which is responsible for 63% of glucose decrement, and the next is tissue glucose uptake, which is responsible for 22%, and the glucose urea is responsible for 50%. This is done by hydration and insulin administration. During DK management, we should have to address those things. Those are expanding intravascular volume, rehydration therapy, potassium replacement therapy, insulin therapy, avoiding and treating complications if they happen, such as hypoglycemia, cerebral edema, and hypokalemia, treating frustrating factors, and follow up. When we see fluid requirement of DK patients, bolus fluid 10 to 20 ml per kg of NS to be given over one hour and it can be repeated if necessary. Maintenance fluid of 48 hours plus deficit fluid calculated as 85 ml per kg minus bolus fluid should be calculated and it is given over 48 hours in the form of normal saline with potassium 40 millimole in 1000 ml of normal saline. Keep manitol at the bedside especially in severe decay because they are at risk of developing cerebral edema and we should have to treat it immediately. The other issue in DK is potassium. Serum potassium is often normal or increased at admission, but in reality there is always a deficit in potassium because initially acidosis causes movement of potassium from intracellular to extracellular fluid because majority of potassium is intracellular and potassium in extracellular fluid is lost in urine from polyuria. And further, serum potassium decreases during treatment because insulin causes movement of potassium from extracellular to intracellular space and the potassium is consumed during glycogen production. So in reality, potassium is depleted in patients with DK, even though serum level became normal or increased. So, Replacement therapy is required regardless of the serum potassium concentration decay. If the patient is hypokalemic, we should have to start potassium replacement at the time of initial volume expansion and before starting insulin therapy with 20 millimole per liter because insulin causes movement of 
potassium from intravascular to intracellular space, which causes further worsening of hypokalemia. If the serum level is normal for potassium, we start replacing potassium after initial volume expansion and the concurrent with starting insulin therapy with 40 mm per liter. And if the serum level is hyperkalemic, the patient is depleted of potassium intracellularly. We should have to give potassium, but we should have to defer administering potassium replacement till the patient has urine output. Potassium replacement should also continue through IV fluid therapy. So if IV fluid therapy continues for 24 or 48 hours, there should be potassium in that fluid. The other is insulin therapy. Start insulin infusion 1 or 2 hours after intravascular volume expansion and the regular insulin 0.1 international per kg per hour. IV infusion should be given. And if there is no infuser or in certain uh, rural or remote hospitals or clinics, we can start with 0.5 international per kg every six hours and half IV and half subtanus for the first dose. Then we continue with 0.5 international per kg subtanus every six hours till the patient is out of decay. Don't omit insulin is the key. Despite the patient's glucose level, we should not omit insulin. If there is a rapid decline of glucose, such as more than 90 mg per day per hour, we can decrease the dose by either 50% or we can consider adding glucose, such as making the fluid half NS and half 5% dextrose, even before plasma glucose has decreased to less than 300 mg per day. We continue the management of decay until the child is out of decay. If we can do pH or arterial blood gas, pH greater than 7.3 or bicarbonate more than 50 mm per liter is an indication for uh, discontinuing management of decay and in our case until the urine is ketone free. After the patient is out of decay to prevent rebound hyperglycemia, the first subcutaneous injection should be given one to two hours before stopping the insulin infusion to allow sufficient time for insulin to be absorbed. Cerebral edema is responsible for 60 to 90 percent of all decay diseases and the most common hours after initiation of therapies within the first 12 to 24 hours of management so we should have to strictly follow the patient with decay chart. Mm -hmm. Regarding insulin correction dose, to know how much one unit of regular insulin decreases the patient's glucose or to decrease the rise in blood acute rise in glucose due to some reason without decay, we divide 1800 by total daily insulin then use that amount of regular insulin subcutaneously that is needed to decrease the patient's insulin to the target you need. So to answer the quiz that we have mentioned at the beginning, a 28 kg school age children taking certain international unit total daily insulin for the past six months with fair glycemic control. Now he has flu since three days back and his random blood sugar is around 400 and his ketone free is not in decay. So if we want to decrease his random blood sugar to a target of 160 mg per day, how much regular insulin do you need to give? So according to the above formula, correction dose for this child is 1800 divided by 30 because he is taking certain international unit regular insulin, insulin daily, total insulin. This is around 60. So one international unit regular insulin subcutaneous will decrease the blood sugar by 60 mg per day. Our patient blood sugar is 400, our target is 160, we should have to decrease by 240. So if one unit regular insulin decreases by 60, we need four international units regular insulin subcutaneous to decrease blood sugar by 240 mg per day. The other is if the patient is going to eat some carbohydrates, we should have to cover it or carbohydrate coverage. This is calculated by 500 divided by total insulin dose and this result or x so one international unit regular insulin covers x gram of carbohydrate the other is dk management complication the most common dk management complications are hypoglycemia cerebral edema and hypokalemia so we need to follow the child with vital sign frequent blood glucose level urine ketone and also electrolyte measurement to act accordingly and if available 
arterial blade gas analysis is important and we should have to follow with DK follow up chart which consists of all those things. Yeah. There is long term management of type 1 DM patient is uh, regarding replacement therapy, insulin therapy, children with long standing diabetes and no insulin reserve requires about 0.7 international unit per kg per day if pre pubertal and around mini puberty they need around 1 international unit per kg per day. And at the end of puberty, 1.2 international unit per kg per day. And we should have to adjust after starting with this dose according to the patient's response and according to the result of self-monitoring of blood glucose level or hemoglobin A1C on follow-up. Basic education about insulin keeping and injection, meal planning, exercise, about symptoms of hypoglycemia importance of self-monitoring of blood glucose and the impact of poor control of DM should be given for the family and also for the patient. Or long-term follow-up of type 1 DM, self-monitoring of blood glucose is very important. This means measuring your blood glucose before and one to two hours after each meal, including the evening snack as well as once during the night, preferably between 2 and 3 a.m. But at least four blood glucose tests per day before each main meal and before going to bed that generally necessary to give the information needed to adjust insulin dose from day to day. Ideally, the blood glucose concentration should range from approximately 80 to 140 mg per day, 80 at the fasting state and 140 mg after meals. But in practice, however, a range of 70 to 250 mg per day is acceptable. Regarding target blood glucose and hemoglobin A1C, there is a target based on the pre-meal 30 days average blood glucose level and also target hemoglobin A1C based on age of patients as you see on the table. Hemoglobin A1C is a reliable index of long-term glycemic control which is provided by measurement of glycosylated hemoglobin and it represents the fraction of hemoglobin to which glucose has been non-enzymatically attached in the blood stream, which is measured 3 to 4 times per year because the half-life of red blood cell is around 120 days. In non-diabetic individuals, the hemoglobin A1C fraction is usually less than 6, and in diabetes, on follow-up, a value of 6 to 7.9 represents good metabolic control, 8 to 9.9 .9 is fair control, and the more than 10 is poor control. When we see the importance of exercise, on type 1 DM, non form of exercise including competitive sports should be forbidden to the diabetic child, but the risk of hypoglycemia is there during or within hours after exercise, so blood glucose measurement is important. And they have to take candy or soft drink immediately after there are symptoms of hypoglycemia. The other issues about sick day management or illness and the need for insulin. Fever increases the need for insulin because during fever there is increased stress hormones which antagonize the action of insulin but decreased appetite and the food intake during illness decrease the need for insulin thus they will be probably have at least the same need for insulin over 24 hours as usual if appetite is not bad they are likely to need up to 20 percent more insulin when they are fever because of stress hormones which antagonize the action of insulin and they could also be at risk for ketoacidosis caused by insulin deficiency but they may also need less insulin if they have gastroenteritis with vomiting and the diarrhea. So we should have to adjust based on whether the patient is having normal appetite during fever or decreased appetite. If the patient is having fever without uh, change in appetite, it is better to increase the dose of the insulin up to 20%. But if the patient is having gastroenteritis or having uh, diarrhea and the vomiting or poor appetite, it is better to follow the random blood sugar without increasing the needle and the dose of insulin. This is a short summary of management of type 1 DM and the DK. Thank you for watching.